Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Neil Shore. I'm the medical director of Carolina Urologic Research Center and a uh, chief medical officer at Genesis Care US for surgery and urology. What a great pleasure to be invited by uh, Dr. Faye Stern to come to ADME Tech. I've been a tremendous fan and supporter of Dr. Stern and all that she's done for ADME Tech over the years. Great advances and great understanding and how we can better uh, evaluate and diagnose uh, men with prostate cancer. Uh, my uh, honor today is to dis discuss uh, really the new newest advance in imaging, uh, which is the uh, PSMA PET-CT, and I'll touch on the clinical applications. Uh, as you all are aware, uh, prostate cancer can present in many different uh, ways. It can be localized, it can be uh, extra prostatic, locally, pelvic, and it can be really in anywhere in the body. Uh, of note, uh, over 90% of patients with uh, castration-resistant prostate cancer will have developed bone metastases. Of course, one can develop bone metastases with uh, newly diagnosed castration-sensitive prostate cancer, whether it's de novo or recurrent, de novo with newly diagnosed recurrent after radiation uh, treatment or prostatectomy where disease recurs. A very low percentages can be within uh, areas such as the pericardium, as you see here. Um, autopsy studies show that there's a surprisingly higher amount of disease in the central nervous system. Of course, there's a high propensity in the soft tissue, pelvic lymph nodes, retroperitoneal lymph nodes, but even areas such as the adrenal glands. And then of course, from a visceral standpoint, the most common areas would be liver and lung, visceral metastases, clearly a harbinger of worse prognosis. Bone and visceral is even worse. Um, and so identifying patients with uh, accuracy of imaging is really important. It always has been uh, from the early days of our ability to do just plain uh, rentography. Well, let's talk about the PSMA per se. This is uh, a really fascinating uh, transmembrane uh, molecule, and it's extra and intracellular. And what makes this antigen particularly appealing is this transmembrane uh, molecular morphology. It has an appealing uh, target for what we're now reviewing is theranostic or PSMA targeted radio ligand therapy. There are a lot of different ways of saying it, but it's this transmembrane molecular formulation that makes it very appealing. In addition, PSMA PET is really remarkably accurate in identifying micrometastatic disease that heretofore we've been unable to identify. And I'm going to uh, show you during this presentation a series of studies and publications that back this up, starting with newly diagnosed high grade disease that has extra prostatic extension, biochemical relapse, metastatic disease, the extent of that metastatic disease. And then in the castrate resistant arena, both non metastatic by conventional imaging standards as well as metastatic CRPC. Now, I mentioned non-prostatic or extra-prostatic, but there's a difference, isn't there? And the top bullet refers to another way of describing the prostate-specific membrane antigen. But PSMA is a little bit of a misnomer, isn't it? Because it can be expressed in normal tissue as opposed to prostate-specific antigen or PSA. Uh, PSMA it uh, can be in normal tissues. It can be associated with uh, uh, neovascularity of tumor. And so, as you see in the, uh, the figure to the right, there can be off-target effects when we start uh, using applications of theranostics or therapeutics. And we'll get into the, uh, the, the definition of why we now say theranostics in a minute. But it's important to recognize that you have PSMA um, expression in salivary glands, you see this notable here in uh, lacrimal, parotid, submandibular. Uh, it can be in the neovascularity of the bowel as well. So this is important when one starts to think about not only its diagnostic potential, but therapeutic potential as well. Now, we have traditionally done very well with um, the standard of care conventional imaging techniques. And now, 
I think it's fair to say that you know, the great work done by the prostate cancer working groups, one, two, and three, we've sort of standardized how we think about using a conventional imaging with technetium bone scan and CT scan. You know, these are both um, widely available. The challenge with technetium bone scan is there's a lot of false positives. There can be degenerative joint disease, old trauma uh, related uh, false positive bone cysts. And so that can be challenging. And then also uh, in lower levels of PSA, technetium bone scan is not particularly helpful. CT scan, uh, particularly good for large lymph nodes, usually by the definition of one centimeter or greater, but there it's less accurate oftentimes in identifying micrometastatic disease of smaller lesions in the liver and even in the lung and even smaller soft tissue disease. Uh, and so what are the implications of a test uh, an imaging modality such as um, PSMA PET CT that could better identify with greater accuracy will it change clinical decision making or what's the clinical utility? And, and that's really what's coming into uh, focus in 2021. Uh, MRI is very good, but it really seems to be largely beneficial for patients who uh, are newly diagnosed looking at extra prostatic involvement as we plan either surgical or radiation approaches. So PSMA, as we've said, and here's the, the, the I think it's easier for most of us to think about calling it prostate-specific membrane antigen as opposed to glutamate carboxypeptidase 2. Um, it's overexpressed on prostate tumor cells, even more so when testosterone is suppressed. And so you see a bifurcation in this diagram of two very well described now a PSMA PET uh, technologies, the gallium 68 and the 18F PYL. I'm going to focus today mainly on the gallium 68. I'm also then going to focus on the lower uh, diagonal as going from a diagnostic to a therapeutic. And I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about the vision trial, which I had the privilege to uh, enroll as a urologist. I, I, I believe it's fair to say we were one of the highest enrolling urology, community-based urology sites globally. So we were very proud to uh, be part of the, the vision trial. So what makes for a good imaging target and why is PMSA a good imaging target? Well, I've already said it's highly expressed in prostatic epithelial cells. It's upregulated in prostate cancer, particularly with testosterone suppression. Um, oftentimes, the expression can correlate with tumor stage and a higher likelihood of recurrence. The avidity of the PSMA is a particularly correlative. And that can be also correlative with the level of the, the grade group, uh, going from grade groups uh, three, four, and five in particular. Uh, it can be, in some studies, associated with a, a poor prognosis, the amount of expression. And it actually, from a therapeutic standpoint, it can be targeted both with an antibody to PSMA as well as small molecules. Now, there's different therapeutic implications, uh, but nonetheless, uh, different. Uh, it creates for a myriad of, of targets. There can be, and I think this is was I touched on earlier, the last bullet, which is the external PSMA ligands can undergo constitutive cell internalization after binding, and then. Uh, that gets translated into, uh, you know, internally into the cell or into the nucleus. So the value of PSMA PET in primary diagnosis and in staging. Well, I'm going to go through a series of slides. And what you see over here is this uh, interesting ROC curve, looking at sensitivity and specificity. But uh, a, a nice paper published by Iber in European Urology, uh, uh, demonstrating that looking at just uh, for newly diagnosed patients with presumed localized disease, uh, looking for uh, areas uh, that would have detected uh, disease potentially even uh, extra prostatic. A multiparametric MRI at a detection rate of 66%. Looking at PSMA PET, PSMA PET MR combined, uh, a north of 90%. So that one can, can certainly potentially 
suggest a widening of therapeutic suggestions, perhaps from localized therapy, localized and combined with a systemic therapy or localized therapy, whether it's surgery or radiation, combined with a, additional uh, radiation or even in combination with a systemic therapy. Another nice paper by Grubmuller um, published in 2018, uh, looking at gallium 68, and this was in patients with biochemical recurrence, so having failed um, their uh, prostatectomy, and looking at 117 patients who had not received testosterone suppression, what was the detection rate, especially by PSA range? And as we know, historically, 0 0.2 to 0 0.5, 0 0.5 to 1, 1 to 2, and greater than 2, one can see over here in this paper, this publication, a few years ago, that the detection rates were actually quite remarkable, um, 65, 86, 100%. And one can see in the table to the right where these PSMA PET AVID lesions were in 100 patients. And there's a smattering of this in patients who'd had biochemical relapse. Now, again, how can you use this information? And we're, we're continuing to do clinical studies to figure out in this, especially in the setting where conventional imaging is negative, very frequently in, in PSAs under one, and frequently even one to two, uh, what would this do? Would you continue to just monitor? Would you go for T suppression? Would you think about uh, metastasis-directed therapy, a clinical trial, which would be ideal, or some combination thereof? Very nice work, tremendous work by uh, our colleague Michael Hoffman in Australia. He's really been at the forefront of doing some great studies. This was published in Lancet 2020. This particular study uh, looking at uh, PSMA PET CT for initial staging of high risk, newly diagnosed high risk prostate cancer patients. This is the pro PSMA study, multi-center study. And essentially one can see really, you can look at the sensitivity specificity confidence intervals, but looking at, at nodal involvement versus any metastatic disease, one can see when one compares in the blue box, the conventional imaging, CT scan, technetium bone scan versus PSMA PET, uh, a delta regarding the accuracy of 92% versus 65% as it relates to just CT, a sensitivity of favoring PSMA PET of 85 to 38% when combining CT and bone scan, and likewise a specificity of 98% to 91%. So this was a really a cutting edge paper. And to the credit of our nuclear medicine radiology colleagues, you know, globally, uh, who, who have really been really touting this, but it, it took really some very nice studies such as this to in a randomized multicenter study to really further bring evidence-based uh, findings to um, the, the world of advanced prostate cancer. Um, and now that was for, you know, initial diagnosis. What about for patients in lymph node staging? Uh, nice papers, uh, and you see the references uh, below, but essentially the advantage of the PSMA PET as opposed to traditional CT scan, again, looking at these uh, ROC curves, is um, where the PSMA PET is in the orange red, and as opposed to uh, traditional morphologic in imaging by CT or MR, one sees a marked improvement in detecting lesions less than 10 millimeter or one centimeter. Uh, markedly better than both CT and MR, uh, the PSMA PET detecting nod nodal location and disease in two thirds of CT negative patients. And so it's this study with many others, which logically leads one to conclude that if I'm trying to get as most accurate diagnosis as I can for informing a patient about treatment decision-making, localized only, perhaps even active surveillance, as opposed to uh, a combination of surgery radiation or radiation and systemic therapy, the, the permutations are endless, but with additional information, one can make a more presumed informed decision. And here's uh, some additional uh, work done for a PSMA PET CT and PSA recurrence. Um, again, Iber uh, reference here, 
uh, Rauscher in 2018, uh, Pereira, Caroli, numerous studies here, enhanced detection efficacy with low levels of PSA less than 0.4 nanogram per ml, and a 55% detection rate, even if it's between 0.2 and 0.5, and 74% in 0.5 to 1.0 in the Rauscher paper. Uh, I think getting down to the last bullet by uh, a paper by Mac Roach is the change in management in uh, almost two thirds of patients that had BCR after surgery or radiation in comparison to conventional imaging. And at the end of the day, making that informed decision is what we want. What about um, detecting metastasis? Uh, in various uh, diagnostic settings. So this is a little bit of a busy site, so I apologize for that, but you can see the um, reports listed here, and they, uh, they're sort of summarizing for you that the primary tumor detected in 92% of metastases, um, in 92% of, there were metastases in 12% of patients, and one can see the variation in the, the grade group or the ISUP uh, reference, which is important, right, because we typically are more concerned that the clinically significant cancers, three, grade groups three, four, and five, and there seems to be a correlation with that as well as with the PSA level. The fourth bullet in particular, I've already touched on the importance how the accuracy and the enhanced sensitivity and specificity can change management, but the, the fourth bullet where uh, gallium 68 PSMA PET, you know, again in 12 studies of a systematic review, outperformed conventional imaging with a specificity of greater than 90% across this analysis. So I think it's fair to say that we're launching into a new world where the standard of care is going to be PET PSMA. Now, some of our colleagues in the world have already witnessed that in Australia and Germany. Uh, I think in the U.S., and I'll get to this, we, we just had the uh, approval in the late um, fall, early winter 2020 a PSMA gallium uh, at UCLA and UCSF, and I'll just show that indication in a minute. This paper gets quoted quite a bit. It's from Fendler and was presented in CCR. They looked at about 200 patients who had traditional non-metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer. And of course, we have these three wonderfully conducted global studies, Spartan, Prosper, Aramis, which respectively evaluated apalutamide, enzalutamide, and darolutamide, respectively, in combination with ADT versus ADT and placebo. All three trials were successful, demonstrating not only a delay in metastasis, ultimately meeting the goal of improved metastasis-free survival, but then subsequent analyses also showed improvement in overall survival. But nonetheless, these are patients who have rising PSA and a castrate level of T, and so their conventional imaging was negative. Well, in this particular study of 200 plus patients, 98% were positive. Uh, of note, 55% were extra pelvic, 44% were within the pelvis. It's that 44%, which would have been perfectly suited to be Spartan, Prosper, Aramis trial candidates. It's not to say that they couldn't benefit from an androgen receptor pathway inhibitor if they have extra pelvic disease, but it is interesting to contemplate the greater accuracy of the findings. And so there's undoubtedly many of these types of patients made it into those three very important trials. And what about uh, PSMA PET imaging in metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer? Well, looking at a literature review of 11 different studies comparing uh, to bone scan, traditional technetium bone scan, PSMA PET was more sensitive and specific to detect metastases. And again, this, as in the Fendler paper, there was a, a you would expect to see upstaging from NMCRPC to MCRPC. And, and this could give an opportunity for uh, PSMA guided uh, MDT or metastasis directed therapy. You can do this with radiation if they were in lymph nodes. Sometimes there can be a, a lymph node removal, could be potentially performed laparoscopically or robotically. But at the end of the day, there really is currently not enough level one evidence on the therapeutic consequences. 
And that's why studies are extremely important. And that's the, the second bullet under the EAU guideline comment. EAU suggests that with bone scan and CT scan, the use of PSMA PET uh, for progressing CRPC is unclear, but most likely not as beneficial for patients who have BCR or hormone naive disease. So particularly valuable there. In the MCRPC, perhaps it is not, but there may be s- subtle populations where uh, direct therapy could be a benefit. Of course, that's where we need to do clinical trials. So detection rates per region and per patient. I, I think Jeremy Calais spoke last year at Admi Tech. He's also done exceptional work uh, at UCLA. This is a really nicely authored paper with, you know, you can see the authors here, uh, Tom Hope uh, and s- uh, several others who I'm sure you're very familiar with are doing really great work. And, and this was comparing the, the current uh, flucyclovine uh, test on the U.S. known as the Axumin test. And where did this stack up in a, a comparator study uh, with PSMA PET in the dark blue or the kind of turquoise color is the PSMA PET and the bright blue is the flucyclovine. And when one looks at you know differences in the area of the body per patient, the differences between the two modalities uh, in patients who had early BCR after prostatectomy, one sees the increase in presumed sensitivity and specificity of the PSMA versus the flucyclovine test. Now, the, the axumin is certainly a good test, but it does seem maybe with the exceptions of, of areas within and around the bladder that the PSMA PET will, will eclipse it in its use. So I mentioned earlier that at the uh, early winter, the FDA, uh, thanks to uh, the uh, uh, applications that were spearheaded by UCLA and UCSF, PSMA gallium PET uh, scan was approved at those two centers. And the approval was for suspected metastasis for patients who are candidates for initial definitive therapy or with suspected recurrence based upon an elevated serum PSA level. Um, There is a PDUFA date, probably right around the the time of our meeting. Um, And so it'll be really interesting to potentially have this uh, testing modality available uh, throughout the US. And so we await that decision. So Patient selection, if, if you have the test available to you or, and it does get approved, hopefully, then also we have the option of even sending patients to California. What are the pros of getting the test? Well, you can maximize the likelihood of identifying a responder, potentially uh, a responder who's undergone treatment and we see resolution, although those types of trials continue to uh, are required and we need to see what is the implication of someone who uh, may be responding to one form of imaging and not to another, and certainly n- irrelevant for PSMA PET. If we have a patient who is uh, not responding, that could also change our therapeutic line of care. And, and it potentially could even r- reduce uh, metastasis directed therapy. Unfortunately, there's always the cost issue, and there can be, because of that, with socioeconomic and geographical issues, we uh, have to be guardians for health disparities. And one can be uh, looking and and, and suggesting that if if not interpreted correctly, uh, that the the findings could lead to excessive treatment. We have to be uh, very cognizant for that as well. And likewise, we have approved therapies. We now have 11 life prolonging therapies for patients who have um, CRPC. It's quite amazing compared to the one back in 2004. Um, But in terms of future drug development and for future sequencing combination paradigms and or uh, understanding of relapse is really fertile soil for additional studies. So PSMA's use along the prostate cancer continuum. I spent a good amount of the first part or a little more than half of the lecture talking about staging and how it's going to be clearly advantageous. The PSMA expression has been negatively correlated with survival outcomes and disease recurrence, 
But at now it can also lead to uh, a management change in more than half of our patients uh, and, and a, a disease state change in al almost two thirds of patients. And so this really makes us both better diagnosticians, but also better management discussions for patients regarding their care. So this leads us to uh, PSMA PET can localize prostate cancer, as I've uh, hopefully explained with high sensitivity and specificity. But getting back to this concept about the uh, its transmembrane function going from extracellular to intracellular, this allows for the, the use of a linker or chelator, a binding a motif, and then ultimately uh, with uh, the linker to a uh, radiopharmaceutical, which could be a beta particle, an alpha particle, which ultimately delivers the payload uh, for cytotoxic or apoptotic effect. And interestingly, it's agnostic to tumor location because PSMA is so overexpressed as opposed to traditional approved radiopharmaceutical alpha particle like radium, which really only goes to bone. Uh, PSMA can target soft tissue and visceral metastases as well as bone. So we have this new verbiage of, of a theranostic. It's really a, 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 a hybridization of the word therapy and diagnostic. I talked about the targeting ligand, which is the, you know, the PSMA, and basically it can be attacked through a, a small molecule or an antibody. Uh, we look at uh, linkers or change, which basically uh, allow for this, the payload to be delivered. Now, diagnostic radionuclides include, you see them listed here, that doesn't just stop with gallium, uh, but you have um, multiple ones here. And then the therapeutic radionuclides, the one we'll talk most about in a few minutes is lutetium and the results from the vision trial, but there are so many others that are coming forward. Of course, radium-223 approved in 2013 for both pre-chemotherapy and post-chemotherapy MCRPC. Uh, and there is, this is not an exhaustive list. This is a very exciting field and there are going to be numerous studies and I'll talk a little bit more about that, but let's get to the vision trial. I mean, arguably, in ASCO 2021, I think uh, you can make the statement that uh, the results of the vision trial uh, were the most important uh, presentation at ASCO 2021. And, and this was a, a study globally conducted that had patients who had progressive MCRPC had uh, progressed on, uh, had to have had a previous taxane as well as a uh, novel hormonal agent, typically abiraterone or enzalutamide. Many of the patients had both. Many of these patients had both uh, uh, docetaxel and cabazitaxel. And they had to have undergone a PSMA, a gallium, a PET-CT. And what we found in that study was 87% of the patients were positive uh, for uh, having appropriate avidity. And then the patients ultimately were randomized uh, two to one to receive uh, upwards of six cycles of lutetium PSMA uh, versus getting uh, a best supportive care. And uh, the trial endpoints were overall survival as well as RPFS and resist response and SSE. And I'll just jump right to the Kaplan-Meier. Uh, again, we were very uh, happy to have enrolled uh, nearly a, a dozen patients in the study and what you see here is the RPFS with a hazard ratio of 0 0.4. And by the way, the best standard of care included uh, additional ARPIs, uh, estrogens, steroids, but could not include at the time any additional taxane-based treatment or radiopharmaceutical. And then one sees here at the median is an 8.7 to 3.4 month difference. So this was a heavily pretreated population with a very high tumor burden, demonstrating a really um, very significant uh, RPFS benefit. Data was very uh, nicely presented by Mike Morris of Memorial Sloan Kettering. And to go in, in correlation with that was the overall survival hazard ratio of 0.62. In keeping with many of the CRPC-approved agents, that 0 0.6, 0 0.7 a hazard ratio, but nonetheless very significant for this heavily pretreated and heavily high tumor burden population. 
uh, a median OS benefit of approximately four months. Uh, very, very impressive. So this is the first large global phase three trial with a, a targeted radiopharmaceutical uh, targeting PSMA that has reported out. This is clearly now going to be submitted to FDA. And I think we're all cautiously optimistic that we may see an approval sometime in the first quarter, hopefully, of 2022. This will undoubtedly open up um, the floodgates for numerous other PSMA-targeted radioligand therapies, and obviously, like in so much of our advanced prostate cancer, move the trials to pre-chemotherapy MCRPC, as well as to patients with MCSPC. So I think this is remarkably exciting, the completely unique novel mechanism of action to augment uh, taxane therapy, uh, PARP inhibitor therapy, uh, AR pathway inhibitor therapy, as well as T suppression. So, and uh, even potentially other immuno-oncologic therapies as well. Uh, this is a, just a nice summary of the work that's being done by Tilix Pharmaceuticals in terms of phase one, phase two, phase three studies, looking at different radioactive isotopes. I mentioned there's gallium, but also looking at lutetium, actinium, technetium, gallium, um, and, and, and looking at effects not only just in prostate, but it effects in other uh, tumor streams such as kidney cancer, brain metastases, and, and other uh, uh, effects uh, also for potential bone marrow disease. So it's a really compelling and important uh, uh, time, learning as much as possible to become familiar with PSMA PET gallium 68, especially for our US colleagues, it would be my, my strong recommendation. Uh, regarding cancer care, you know, one can see on the bottom here the, where we've gone. We've had radiotherapy, which has been around for over a century. Uh, surgical treatment has been around for perhaps even a millennium, uh, depending upon in its crudest form. Uh, traditional chemotherapies and hormonal therapies. And now we've moved into this era that we frequently talk about precision therapy, uh, whether it's a genomic profile on correlations, and I think that's extremely important, but certainly a topic for another talk, and then immunotherapies as well, and then add on at the very end, theranostics. Undoubtedly now uh, an area that's extremely important for all of us who are in the, the world of advanced prostate cancer treatment and even high-risk localized prostate cancer treatment. To sum up, uh, last couple of slides, a PSMA PET is a highly effective uh, universal diagnostic tool in various situations and disease stages of prostate cancer. Uh, it can lead to um, upstaging, and that could lead to a change in decision-making uh, regardless of uh, the stage, as you see listed in the parentheses. Um, you can identify metastases much more commonly at lower PSA values uh, compared to traditional uh, conventional imaging and even conventional PET technologies that are available today, such as FDG and or uh, flucyclovine. Um, there are considerable diagnostic consequences um, we need more studies, and, and I think everyone would agree with that, but having a tool that has greater accuracy, sensitivity, and specificity is very valuable. In NMCRPC, uh, this kind of summarizes uh, the work of Fendler. Uh, I put it back in here only because it's so kind of fascinating to think about when conventional imaging doesn't show any disease, yet we know there's a disease uh, there. Patients will frequently say, well, I don't understand, my PSA is going up, CT and technetium or bone scan are negative, where is it coming from? You removed my prostate or you radiated my prostate and nothing was lighting up or even rebiopsied it and there was nothing there. So I think that uh, ultimately at the end of the day, um, the, the, the importance of PSMA PET and how we think about it judiciously entering into our trials will be important and how we potentially restage uh, our thinking around uh, our, uh, where we are currently uh, as it relates to how we've done things really well with PCWG, uh, but also in our, our, our clinical trial landscape. So there's a lot more to, to come, 
Um, but there's no doubt that this is going to change a lot of how we think about uh, the trial landscape and ultimately uh, even outside of the trial landscape are, are the clinical utility and its implications. So um, this is just some final summarizing conclusions. You know, it's important, I think, to note that, you know, still the underlying biology and the therapeutic strategies uh, are still not entirely clear, um, and in, we need further study. And so I think as long as that's done thoughtfully, I've tried to present some of the papers that I think have made a, a significant difference. I, I know I've missed uh, uh, many, but um, this is a great time for uh, imaging accuracy, enhancing that and enhancing our, our, our clinical management, but also uh, arguably the possibility for designing our, our trials going forward. Well, with that, um, thank you very much for your attention. It's a great pleasure to present today to the AdmiTech Symposium. Honored to, to have this opportunity. Uh, really appreciative to the folks at Telix Pharmaceuticals for sponsoring uh, this program. Uh, I'm really looking forward to doing continued uh, research with them. Uh, both in the diagnostic and also on the theranostic side. Um, I'm happy to take some questions and, and look forward to having some further dialogue. Again, thanks very much.